Okay, I'll be back down if you didn't get all that. Let's talk about that outer boundary, the plasma membrane, cell membrane, you'll hear it sometimes listed as that. The structure that separates the cell's internal environment from the outside environment, okay? So it's like the walls of this room that keeps us in and keeps people out there out, okay? Um, so that's what we would say internal environment, what's inside, outside environment would be out, okay? Um, we can describe it as a selective barrier that plays a role in cellular communication. So it helps cells communicate with one another. A lot of that relates to these proteins that we'll be talking about. Um, but what do I mean when I say a selective barrier? We have a guess. What's that? Yeah, so what do I mean when I say um, the plasma membrane acts as a selective barrier? It can let stuff in, but not any and everything. It can also let stuff out, okay? Cells, for example, cannot produce their own oxygen. Where do we get our oxygen? We breathe it in, okay? That means that oxygen that we breathe in must make its way into a cell, okay? And cells produce CO2, and CO2 can be very harmful if it builds up in our body, and it builds up in our cells, so we have to move it out of a cell and then eventually exhale it out. So there's always exchanging of nutrients and waste coming in and out of a cell, but we don't just want any and everything coming into cells so that's what I mean when I say it's like it chooses what can come in and out. Now, if you want to, you can kind of think of the walls of this room like the plasma membrane, as I was kind of saying, okay? Very different than the walls of this room, which are very rigid, made up of center blocks that, you know, if you push as hard as you can, you're not gonna budge them. Plasma membrane is very, very dynamic. It means that um, there's stuff kind of just floating around. It's almost like um, very watery, okay? And that's because there's a, collection of fats. That's what the term lipid means. Lipids is just fancy word for fats. And proteins among a few carbohydrates. And they kind of just mingle around. They're always moving. We actually call this model the fluid mosaic model. And let's talk about those lipids or fats, as I just said, that make up the plasma membrane. The most prominent of those look like these. Okay? What we call phospholipids. If we look at this little figure here, we're just showing one little sm small segment of the plasma membrane. You can see a lot of these, what we call phospholipids. And here's what one looks like zoomed in. To me, it always looks like lollipop with two sticks, okay? There's two major parts of a phospholipid. It's head and the two tails, And okay? Now, it is a unique type of fat because it behaves differently with water than most fats, okay? Any of you like to cook and you've ever put oil in something that was watery, what happens? The oil will just sit on top. Even if you were to take a oil, put it in a jug of water and mix it all up, what's eventually gonna happen? The oil is gonna separate to the top, okay? Oil is a form, and it's a liquid form of fat, okay? Most fats are described as hydrophobic, okay? If you have a phobia, that means what? You're scared of something. Okay, you're afraid of it. Okay, hydro means water. So the term hydrophobic means water fearing. Okay, the tails of a phospholipid are like other fats. Okay, they are water fearing. And that's because they are what we call nonpolar. Okay, so the word hydrophobic, I always tell students just think of it simply, and if you want to write it down this way, hydrophobic means frowning face water. Okay, doesn't like water, it's afraid of it. It repels it, okay? Whereas the heads are unique when it comes to fats. They're polar, which means they have a charge, and they're actually attracted to water. So I always say hydrophilic, <coughs> happy face water, okay? Or the emoji face water, if you want to do it that way. Okay. So likes water, doesn't like water. Okay. Now, water in our body is very prominent. It's inside our cells, it's between our cells, it's all over the place. And so these phospholipids, which group together in the face of water, do so in a very cool way. Okay. They organize into a bilayer, which means there's actually two layers, where the tails of the two layers point together away from the water, and the heads point in opposite directions and that's because the cytosol, which is the fluid inside the cell, has water. And the extracellular fluid, which is the fluid outside the cell, also has water. 
And that really relates to that ability to control what can come in and out of the cell and why it's selective. This fancy way to des um, describe the uniqueness of phospholipids is called amphipathic, which we won't really get into. Okay, those were the prominent, most prominent, I should say, structures of the plasma membrane. Um, next are the glycolipids. Anytime you see the prefix glyco, you can um, assume that's referring to a sugar or a carbohydrate, but the same thing. So it's just a <clears throat> fat or lipid with a carbohydrate attached to it. A not very prominent, but they do have an important role. Um, they always stick out into the extracellular space and help cells adhere to one another to stick together and they may mediate cell-to-cell -cell recognition and communication, along with helping with cell growth and development. Cholesterol, 20% of the lipids um, are found kind of in the interior where those tails, where the phospholipids are. That's what these little yellow squiggly lines are. They help increase the strength of the plasma membrane. Um, now we hear the term cholesterol probably just, you know, um, elicits something in your brain to think, oh, that's bad. Because yeah, you hear about cholesterol being a bad thing. People are talking about, in that case, the cholesterol that floats in our blood, which is the direct result of the things that we eat and um, your lifestyle if you don't get enough exercise. And, um, cholesterol in our cells is actually really good, so don't think of it as a bad thing. Okay, so those are the fats. Proteins, there are two types. We classify them based on their location um, with regards to the plasma membrane. Um, integrals are found kind of throughout both layers of the plasma membrane. Um, so a lot of times you call them transmembrane. Trans means across or through. So they penetrate through the entirety of the plasma membrane. Um, peripherals, you can see, you can find one here on the inside of the cell, one over here on the outside of the cell. They are just on the periphery. That's why they're called peripheral proteins. Okay. Now we'll talk more about proteins and what they do on the next page, like channels um, and um, carriers. We'll get to that here in just a second. Before we do, uh, let's talk about glycoproteins, which a lot of our integrals are. Glycoproteins are like glycolipids in that they have a carbohydrate attached to them. Um, together, glycoproteins and glycolipids kind of give a unique coat on the outside of each cell. It's a sugary coat called a glycocalyx, which is what this term is right there. It's like if we all had different colored jackets on and we could recognize each other by way of those colored jackets, how cells can recognize one another and communicate with one another. So that's kind of cool. It also helps cells stick to one another. Okay. As far as the pictures go, I'm not going to worry about this one, nor am I going to worry about this one, but I actually do want you to know this one, especially the terms hydrophilic for the head, which means, once again, likes water, nonpolar tails are hydrophobic, which don't like. Okay, uh, let's talk about the different proteins that perform specific functions with regards to the cell and the plasma membrane. First, uh, two over here on the right are channels and carriers. Essentially act the same way, they just do so in a little bit of a different manner. Okay, this is the way that a lot of things have to get in and out of the cell, because like you, most things can't just travel through walls. Okay. I assume nobody can float through a wall like a ghost in here. Okay. Everybody I watched come into the room came in through the doorway. Okay. That's how we get in and out of this room. Okay. That's how things like ions, like sodium, potassium, water, glucose, that's how they get in and out of a cell. Okay. The difference between the two really relates to what happens to the protein when the substance moves in or out. Okay. With channels, the protein never changes its shape. Okay? It's like this doorway, not the door itself, but the doorway, which is what surrounds the door, the frame never moves and changes when we come in and out. And now some channels have a gate or a door like what we have that only opens in certain situations, but the actual protein itself doesn't change shape. Okay? Carriers or transporters, see, here, the pore is kind of more open to the outside. And notice this arrow is showing you, and this would be over time, it changes shape and it spits it out on the other side. So there's a physical change in shape that occurs here that doesn't here. Now, these channels and carriers are always going to 
only carry one certain thing. Okay, what I mean is like uh, there's like sodium ion channels. Okay, that means the sodium ion channel is going to carry sodium. It's not going to carry potassium. There's glucose transporters, and all they do is carry glucose. So they're very specific in what they carry. Receptors, this is where uh, you know, a chemical like a hormone could bond to the outside of the cell and trigger a reaction inside. The term ligand that you see here just is um, a fancy way for a word for chemical. Hormones are examples of chemicals. Enzymes, they um, catalyze, which is just a fancy word for speed up chemical reactions. So that's how we can um, perform chemical reactions inside the cell. Uh, linkers, exactly what they sound like. They kind of link um, cells to one another so they can put tissues together essentially. Um, and then the last one, I kind of talked about this on the previous page, along with uh, or the, the glycoproteins, the glycolip is that sugary coat. It gives each cell its own unique distinctive coat. This is very important. Uh, a good example would be like, why our white blood cells don't attack our own cells, typically. And white blood cells are the soldiers of our body that you know, protect us from like viruses and bacteria and toxins. Okay. Well, we have these little, they're like flags that say, hey, I belong here, do not take me out. Fortunately, sometimes our immune system will still destroy our own cells. And that's what causes us like multiple sclerosis and that stuff like that. Pictures on that page, not important. Just the information. All right, so now that we've got a good idea of what's going on on the outside of the cell, we can work our way internally. Okay, I'll be back down if you didn't get them all. I promise I'll be back. Inside your cell is a fluid that I was talking about on that previous page. And it was actually two pages back. Okay, here it's listed as cytosol. Another term for that is intracellular fluid. Intra means inside or within. Extra, where that means outside. Okay, intracellular fluid or cytosol, the same thing. That's the fluid. That's the watery portion inside your cell. Okay, but crack open a cell it wouldn't just be like leaky water. That's really nice and runny. Okay. That's because that water is also loaded up with various organelles. And so it's more like a jelly, thicker fluid. So it's not solid, it's not really runny, it's somewhere in that kind of gray area between. And that's what we call cytoplasm. So cytoplasm is the fluid plus the organelles. The fluid itself is just cytosol. You'll probably hear me use these interchangeably. Technically, truly, it's, they're not. Now, as far as the cytosol goes, it's far from being structureless, and that's because there's a very intricate three-dimensional array of proteins, what we call the cytoskeleton, for the three things that you just wrote down. Okay. You see the word cyto, the prefix cyto, we learned the other day about that, means cells. So this is the cell's skeleton that gives our cells their very distinctive shape, helps organize those organelles, and um, you know, just kind of holds things in place the way that they're supposed to. First of the three are what we call microtubules. Microtubules are the largest, having a diameter of about 25 nanometers, which are very small, but as far as these three things go, they're the largest. Okay. This is what they look like if you zoom in at them. Each of these little ball-like structures is a singular protein called tubulin. Together, they come together and form this tube-like structure. So microtubules are tube-shaped, 
and they're made up of a protein called tubulin. So you see tube, that's kind of the theme there. Um, they begin in organelles. You can see centrosomes here in our picture. Talk about those on the next page. Uh, most importantly, uh, what I want you to know is what they do. They help give cells their distinctive shape. They help with movement of organelles. I'll skip the next one. They form specialized cell projections. The third one is probably what they're most notorious for, and that's with helping with mitosis and meiosis. Mitosis and meiosis is fancy ways to describe cell division. So if you've learned about prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase at any point in your life, okay, it's when chromosomes are pulled to opposite ends of a cell and then the cell splits in two. Okay? The things that come across the cell and grab those chromosomes from the center, they to me always have looked like spider legs. Okay? Those spider legs, and you can actually kind of see this, it almost looks like a spider, are those microtubules. So that's how they help with cell division. So if you remember that from biology, whether it was high school or college, you've already learned about microtubules. Intermediate fibers or filaments, as they're also known as, are thicker than microfilaments and thinner than microtubules, so that's why they call them intermediate. They're right between the other two in size. Um, there's several different types of proteins that form them based on the cell. Um, what they do is resist mechanical stress to the cell, stabilize the position of organelles, attach cells to one another. Last ones are the smallest diameters of about seven nanometers. Um, protein that makes them up is actin, which we'll talk a lot about when we talk about muscles um, and muscle contractions, which you can see is one of the things that microfilaments do. Generate movement, and in parentheses it says muscle contraction, cell division, and cell locomotion, because some cells can move. Provide for much of the mechanical support responsible for basic strength and shape of the cells, which you can see they're kind of on the outside of the cell. And what we're going to talk about on the next page are extensions of the cells like microvilli, um, which is a plural form of the word microvillus here on this picture. As far as uh, the images go on this page, none are important to study, so don't worry about them. I'll let you guys write all these out and then we'll go through them. Okay, let's talk about centrosomes. We mentioned those on the previous page. It can be described as organelles located near the nucleus. We saw here on this picture. Um, they're fairly complicated, even though they're really small. Um, their anatomical makeups, a bunch of protein stuff that really, just, whenever I talk about it, just seems to fly over the heads of students. So I'm not even going to really get into it. So what I would focus on for study purposes would be those three bullets there on what they do. Um, as we talked about, they help anchor and assemble microtubules, aid in chromosomal movement during cell division, and they help with the movement of flagella and cilia, which we'll talk about here at the bottom. Okay. Now, I mentioned that you guys can use kind of this room as a, a representation of a cell. Um, everybody's been in here now, so they kind of have a good idea of the layout of this room. It's nice and square, maybe a little bit rectangular, okay. perfect size. A lot of cells are nice and square like that. Some are circular. But a lot of cells, what we see are cells that aren't perfect squares or perfect circles or whatever. Instead, they might be nice and square, but then one of the sides, they've got these kind of jaggedy pushing out structures, okay, like what we see right here with microvilli. 
which the word once again microvilli is plural, villus is singular since only one of them is circular. We find them in epithelial cells that lie in our intestines, it's like the small intestines. Um, we find them in our kidneys where we do a lot of what we call absorption, okay, which means that something's coming into a cell. What they do is they're very small, but still very important because they increase surface area. That's a phrase you'll see and hear a lot this semester. In this case, it essentially just means the amount of cell membrane. So that gives more contact between the plasma membrane and whatever is being absorbed. So let me kind of explain. Okay. So let's use the two ends of this cell, this side from here to here. You guys all would hopefully agree with me that this is the same width across here as it is up here. Okay. But down here, the amount of membrane is only from here across like so. The amount of membrane, all this blue over here at the top, thanks to those microvilli, you have to travel like this to go all the way across. Now, within this blue shaded area, that's where you're gonna find a lot of channels and carriers that we were just talking about bringing stuff in. So there's a lot, of more, a lot more doors for stuff to get in and out of the cell. And a great thing about this picture, it shows you three-dimensionally that there's multiple roads. The cells are three-dimensional structures, a not 2D boxes, okay, but you know, cubes in this case. So they help with bringing stuff in and out of cells like we see there. Cilia, we can see a picture to show you how they work. Um, here's what an actual set of cilia look like inside of our trachea, which is our windpipe. Um, that's a real picture of real hair-like structures extending off of the cell, which is what cilia are. Cilia don't move the cell, but they move substances across the surface of the cell um, like a conveyor belt. If you think of it that way, they push the stuff along. They like the stuff when we breathe in dust, it gets trapped in our trachea by mucus that lines our trachea. And then that mucus and dust gets pushed up and out. We can cough it out that way or it even actually gets digested in our stomach, which is kind of gross, but actually is super important and healthy. Um, other places cilia are found, like in the female's uh, fallopian tubes to help push the egg towards the uterus when she's ovulating. Um, this is a pretty cool picture um, done with a, a special type of microscope, zoomed in 3,000 times what your naked eyes can see. Pretty crazy. The far right picture shows you what a flagella can do. Uh, flagellum actually is a singular form of flagella. Um, those are whip-like tails that you find only on one type of cell in the human body, sperm. And they help with swimming. If you've ever seen a snake swim? Um, they move in a kind of rhythmic, coordinated way to allow sperm to try to penetrate and fertilize an egg. Pictures on that page, not important either. All right, let's talk about our next, possibly the most important of all of our organelles. Well, they're all important, but this one is kind of the, the boss, our nucleus. Okay. What we can describe as the largest organelle in the body, or in the cell, excuse me, um, where we contain our hereditary units, what we call genes. So notice genes with a G, not with a J, so not what you wear. But genes are the things that code for our individual characteristics. For example, like our skin color and our hair color that we can all see on each other around the room, and it's all unique to each one of us. Genes control cellular structure and cellular activity, so we can say that nucleus, the nucleus is responsible for controlling cellular structure and cellular activities. We have within our nucleus chromosomes, which each contain thousands of our genes. A, a typical human cell will contain 46 chromosomes, and that's because the sperm that came from dad contained 23 
the egg that came from mom contained 23 and 23 plus 23 is? 46, very good. Okay. A chromosome can be described as a long winding molecule of DNA. Right before a cell divides, the DNA, we all know what DNA looks like, it coils up around proteins and then you end up with these big, and they're not really big because you know, I think we're talking really, really small here. They look like a capital X. Okay. If you've ever seen pictures of chromosomes, you know what I'm talking about. And if I go down to the picture at the bottom, which this is a zoom in at that nucleus uh, from our first page picture, over here on the right, this is an actual nucleus, zooming in now 10,000 times to the naked eye can see. So that's really cool. That's an actual picture of a nucleus. We don't see any of those capital X's, and that's because most of the time, a cell's not dividing. Okay, about, well, I wouldn't be that in depth. But most of a cell's life is spent just doing normal cell activities. And so the DNA is not in a condensed chromosomal state. Instead, it's unwound, and so it looks kind of grainy along with proteins and a cousin of DNA, RNA, which we call chromatin. Chromatin is where you find the DNA right before cell division is when that would um, dis disappear and we'd see those chromosomes developing. Okay. The, the um, chromatin is located within the nucleus in what's called the nucleoplasm. Like the cytoplasm that's inside the cell, this is specifically inside the nucleus. Semifluid membrane surround, or excuse me, semifluid uh, surrounded by a membrane. And that membrane surrounds the entire nucleus, and we call that a nuclear envelope. Okay, sometimes you'll see it listed as a nuclear membrane. Same thing like what we saw around the cell. The plasma membrane was a double membrane separated what's inside from outside. Same concept exists here. There are proteins that form doorways in and out of the nucleus. These are called nuclear pores. We can kind of zoom in at them and see them here in this picture B. Um, yeah. At the center of the nucleus is a kind of secondary organelle um, called the nucleolus. It does not have a, a membrane surrounding it, and that's why it says uh, a non-membranous body. Its job is to form RNA, to synthesize, which means just to create RNA, which is, like I said, kind of like DNA's cousin. We use RNA to make proteins. Like melanin, for example, that's the protein that we use to make our skin color, our hair color, and our eye color. And we all have a different type of melanin that we produce, which is controlled genetically by who our parents were or are. And they give us those instructions for the melanin that we produce. So we'll talk about melanin next week because we'll be talking about the skin and that kind of stuff. So overall functions of the nucleus, controlling cell activities because it contains DNA that have the instructions, storage of genetic information, synthesis of DNA and RNA. As far as the pictures go, this is a really cool picture on the right. I always try to include real pictures whenever I can, but I rarely, if ever, ask you to know them just because sometimes they're harder to kind of pick out the parts. I do want you to know pictures A and B though. So star them, highlight them, circle them, whatever you need to do, make sure you know them. All right, let's talk about our next organelles. You go back to this previous page. Surrounding the outside of our nuclear envelope, you see these little white silvery dots. We also see a lot of them on what's called the rough and impressive reticulum. Those are these guys, ribosomes. Okay, the sites of what we call protein synthesis. Once again, synthesis just means to create, build, form. So if you can't remember what synthesize means. 
one of those words out. We can say that these are the protein factories of a cell. Very tiny, super complicated in their own right though, uh, made up of more than 50 proteins and a special type of RNA called ribosomal RNA, or rRNA for short. Um, simply, there's two major parts that make up a ribosome, a large subunit, a small subunit. Okay. Uh, we find them in several different places on the outside of the nuclear envelope, as you saw, attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, there's some that just kind of float around the cytoplasm. We call those just free ribosomes. So we have some in our uh, mitochondria. We'll see that next time when we talk about mitochondria. We call those mitochondrial ribosomes. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's for episodes. What we're gonna do now is we're out of time, so we're gonna stop right here, and we will pick up with the endoplasmic reticulum on Monday.